It is now my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Lisa Johnson from Dane County Horticulture Educator. Lisa, thanks for joining us today. We look forward to your presentation on butterfly garden design. Thanks, Anne. Is everybody able to see the presentation? All right, good enough. All right then, let's get started. So many cool things about butterflies to talk about. All right, so this is an overview of the talk. I'm just going to touch a little bit on butterfly physiology and life cycle because it's important to understand how that works so that you can properly design a butterfly garden. And then we'll hit again very briefly on some Wisconsin butterfly information, including a couple of endangered uh, species. And then we'll get into the meat of the presentation, the planning a butterfly garden, where to do it, features to include, and we'll talk about a number of different plant materials that work uh, in butterfly gardens. All right, so we'll start out here with a simple line drawing of a butterfly. Um, some cool things to know is that the antenna uh, do help butterflies to locate and sort of taste uh, plant material. Um, their um, main wings here, the larger set are, are called um, four wings. Uh, so sometimes you'll hear that talked about. They are, of course, insects, so they do have six legs. They have rather large compound eyes that do see in color, but they're kind of nearsighted. Um, they also have this long um, tongue, the proboscis, which will, um, they can extend it and they can retract it. And when they retract it, it's all curled up. So you probably uh, have noted those things if you've already seen butterflies before. And on the females, they have an ovipositor uh, where they lay their eggs that's on the back end of their abdomen here. And butterflies, of course, have four different life stages. They hatch from an egg into a caterpillar, also called a larva. And uh, that's larvae, plural, larva, singular. And the caterpillar goes through a few different instar stages. Uh, those are just as it gets bigger, it molts its skin and then uh, continues to grow. Um, the number of stages uh, of instars varies with the species. Then they go into a uh, chrysalis mode, which is also called the pupa. And that's the uh, structure where they are life stage, where they totally reorganize their bodies uh, from a larval stage to an adult that has wings. So, because we have all these stages, you do need to choose your plant materials and take care of your plant materials in such a way that they are going to support all four of these stages. All right, so moving on to Wisconsin butterflies, a great place for information is wisconsinbutterflies.org, which is um, an amazing site that is part of the Southern Wisconsin Butterfly Association. And that in turn is a local branch of the North American Butterfly Association. So you've got three websites right there to, uh, to check out. Uh, I like to start with the wisconsinbutterflies.org though, because it's got so much amazing targeted stuff about Wisconsin butterflies. Um, also, they hold field trips. If you happen to be in Southern Wisconsin um, and you can, whether you're a novice or an experienced butterfly watcher, you can do that. They also sometimes have tagging events where you capture a butterfly and put a tag on it so it can be monitored. And the website has information on butterflies in groups. So like the skipper group and the swallowtail group, et cetera. What I've got here in the picture on the right-hand side, that's all information off of that website. So you can see the incredible detail that they go into so that you know what the butterfly looks like, both male and female, um, because there are usually differences. 
uh, where the species is found, what it might be doing when you find it, and what time of year is most likely to find it. So it's pretty cool. In Wisconsin, we have uh, about 155 uh, species. Uh, that number um, continues to, to grow as climate change continues. We are getting more butterflies coming into the state from southern areas where it's starting to get too hot for them. And also as we continue to have storms, we do get um, stray species and migrant species that kind of blown up here uh, in storms. But of those 155 that we typically see, more or less, uh, about 118 are what we call permanent residents that will um, lay eggs here and uh, raise caterpillars here and overwinter here. Um, the migrants are ones that don't necessarily overwinter here. So that would be something like the monarch, for example. While they do lay eggs, have caterpillars here, they don't overwinter here. And speaking of monarchs, I just have to talk about monarchs real briefly. Um, they will, over a couple of generations, move from uh, Mexico and Southern California throughout the United States. And they spend um, you know, a generation or several generations up in the Northern and middle part of the country. And then uh, in the fall, the adults um, start to migrate back down. And there's usually a couple generations for that to be um, accomplished as well. Um, and I will say right out, I am not an entomologist. Um, so most of this presentation is focused on how to support butterflies in our gardens, but I just wanted to put in some of the information um, about these amazing uh, insects so that you can follow up and do more um, reading on your own. Here's an example of what they look like where they're in that uh, reproductive diapause stage in um, the forests in Mexico. And one of the reasons we are losing so many of our monarchs is that um, habitat loss uh, and storms in these very few places where they do, and wildfires as well, uh, where they do overwinter. So you can uh, end up with some pretty unfortunate major kill events. We also have uh, the Carnard blue butterfly, which is an endangered species. Very, very tiny, just got a wings, wingspan of about an inch, two generations a year, and those will start to hatch in April from eggs laid the previous year. So they overwinter as eggs, and they only overwinter on wild lupins. And you can see we don't have very many wild lupin um, areas where we find it in the wild in the state. So because they can, the caterpillars have to have wild lupins to uh, feed on, that means the adults can only lay them there. And so it's really important that if we're going to support this species that we allow these wild populations of uh, blue lupins to um, be protected. All right, so moving on to butterfly gardens then. Um, I really encourage you to look at those websites, learn what butterfly species are here, and remember that you need to have both nectar and larval plants um, for supporting the butterflies. And also like with any pollinator, it's important to have season long food sources. Uh, put your butterfly gardens in sun because butterflies as insects are cold blooded and need uh, sunlight to warm up their flight muscles. Also, it's really important to have a variety of different types of plants. And that's because uh, most butterflies need a, uh, the adults need a variety of different nectar sources for proper nutrition. But with the caterpillars, 
Some butterflies are more generalists and will lay their eggs on a variety of plants, but a lot of them are also specialists. So like the monarch and the carner blue, they only have uh, one type of plant that they can lay their eggs on. So in um, Wisconsin, we have uh, 12 species of milkweeds. There's actually some interesting research that talks about which species of milkweed are more attractive to uh, butterflies that are laying eggs, although all of them are attractive to nectar feeding um, adults but not all of them are as favored for laying eggs. Um, and so the females are quite choosy about this. If you've ever seen one ovipositing, it'll fly around uh, among the milkweeds if it's a monarch and it'll land on one, decide, nope, I don't wanna do it here. Flitter off to another one and you know, eventually pick one to lay the eggs on and then it will lay several eggs. But if they can't find one that they like, they're not going to reproduce. So it's important to have um, a variety of plants and also sufficient numbers if you're trying to support um, monarchs uh, in order to have the perfect milkweed plant. Uh, also, do remember your larval plants are there to be eaten. Sometimes I have people that plant butterfly gardens and they call me up and they say, there's something eating my insert name of plant. And I'm like, yeah. That's exactly, that's great. That's what we want to have happen. We want to have those caterpillars feeding on your uh, larval host plants. Now, butterflies overwinter as eggs, pupa, adults, and various instars of caterpillars, depending on what species. And this is a really interesting process. They go into a resting stage called diapause, where they manufacture glycogen that allows their bodies to get very cold, but still be able to survive. And the important part of this is that eggs and pupa survive on uh, dead plant material. So you need to make sure that you don't clean up your plant material uh, too early in the spring. Usually you want to wait until about mid-April in the uh, southern part of the state and later than that up um, more northerly. Um, there's a really interesting handout here uh, that I've given you a link to about that. Now, in your garden, you want to think about not only plant species, but also flower shapes. Um, butterflies, if you've ever seen them flying around, they look like they're having problems with their GPS and they can't decide where to go. Um, but it's, you know, they have these big wings that are like sails and they like to have a large area to be able to land on and cling on to while they're feeding. So a lot of them like these kind of broad flat flowers. If you think about um, daisies, for example, or purple cone flower, zinnias, they really like zinnias, but they also like flowers that have large clusters of smaller flowers that still makes a good landing pad for them. So uh, milkweed, for example, that's a, a cluster of many small flowers. They like mints, uh, calumet and catmint in particular. Um, ornamental onions is another good example of that, and garden flocks. Garden flocks are quite popular. Then there are also the flat types of um, flowers that also have small florets, but they're not rounded or elongated, they're flattened. Um, those are called umbels or um, the same types as well. So if you think about yarrow, that's a good example of those. Now, um, with any pollinator, of course, we encourage you not to use pesticides. Pesticides do migrate through the plant and may accumulate in pollen and nectar, and it may vary with the chemical, the amount uh, or concentration uh, that happens with that. Uh, we just don't have enough good research on the various chemicals and various flowers, and it may vary per flower as well. And even herbicides and fungicides can impact uh, pollen and nectar, so uh, it's important to minimize the use of these as much as possible. 
The other thing to think about is what your style is. You don't have to have a butterfly garden that looks like a prairie if that isn't your style, for example. Um, you can have a very well-kept looking, um, more manicured example of a butterfly garden, more formal, or you can have a less formal one. As long as you have the appropriate plants, and there are many, many ones to choose from, uh, you can have happy butterflies. Um, do keep in mind, though, that while native plants are often best, uh, you still can use other non-native sources. I'm a horticulturist, so I grow plenty of non-native plants along with my native plants. And the butterflies uh, seem to do well with either type of nectar. But again, those that are specialists may need a particular type of plant to host their um, eggs and caterpillars. And people often ignore trees and shrubs, but they can be a great source of nectar and often uh, larval food as well. So here's the elements that are particularly good for butterfly gardens. Um, you do need them in a sunny location, as we mentioned. They're cold-blooded insects. They have a lot of um, tissue that they need to warm up and their um, thoracic muscles that uh, allow the wings to be need to get warmed up too, particularly if you think early in the spring when it's cold in the morning or late in the fall when it's cold in the morning. Uh, they're going to need to warm those muscles up and they use um, rocks uh, to do that often. We'll talk more about that in a second, that basking behavior. They also uh, have a need for puddling particularly the males, and I'll talk about that more in a minute as well. A water source is great for any type of pollinator. Uh, a bird bath can suffice for that, or um, I'll, I'll show you some other um, possibilities that work for that as well. You just, uh, often they like flowing water, but it needs to be a very, very gentle flow so that they don't get um, carried off in it. Uh, and shelter areas, um, often butterflies will hide under structures or in the middle of evergreens in order to shelter themselves during storms or underneath logs or um, lots of places like that. And then again, as we already talked about, both larval and nectar plants are needed to support butterflies. So here's that basking behavior. And you'll see a, a butterfly on a surface like a rock that collects heat where they position their wings at right angles to the light and they are slowly going to open and close those wings to disperse that heat uh, and get it absorbed and into their muscles. But you don't have to use rocks. Um, you can use wooden fence posts. Those also will absorb some heat and are out in the uh, light so that they can um, use those for basking as well. Now here's um, examples of puddling. And this would happen out in the wild in like areas next to streams or uh, boggy areas where you have a wet substrate like uh, mud or wet rocks, typically. Um, sometimes you'll find them perching on dung. Uh, and what they're doing is actually ingesting minerals and nutrients out of the mud, wet rocks, dung, um, decaying fruits, et cetera. And particularly males are going to do this. Um, the sodium and other kinds of salts and minerals and amino acids are important for them to produce um, really quality productive sperm uh, so that they are able to um, you know, fertilize the eggs of the female and end up with good strong offspring. So you'll particularly see males doing this, although females do it too, to a small extent. And here's what a puddling station might look like because we realize that not everybody has a stream going through their backyard. Uh, so you can make puddling stations very easily. Uh, you need a just a very shallow amount of uh, water in a dish of some kind. Again, it can be a bird bath. 
You can see the one in the middle, they've put some banana slices for the butterflies to um, perch on and feed on at the same time. And they're kind of combining that with water so that the water source and the puddling are the same. Uh, the one on the top is a strictly puddling station with some ripe fruit. The one in the bottom also is pretty much strictly puddling because you don't see any free water. Uh, you can just see that the rocks and mud there are um, moist. Now, the problem with using, of course, overripe fruit or ripe fruit once we get into July through September is that yellow jackets like that as well. Um, honeybees too, uh, other types of pollinators, sometimes stinging ones. So uh, sometimes that may not be the best um, option. You may wanna stick with the mud and uh, rocks. Um, also for water source, as well as puddling uh, source, you wanna make sure that either the water flows or that you change it about every six days or so, um, because that's the lifespan of a mosquito from um, egg to larva to um, adult. So you've probably seen the little wigglers uh, of mosquitoes in the water. So it takes about six days for them to develop. If you change your water before six days, they are not gonna have a chance to do it. Also, if it's very shallow, uh, generally um, mosquito larvae are not going to survive very well. Here's what we have in the Dane County Extension Teaching Garden Pollinator Garden uh, as our water source and our puddling station. Um, the rocks are kept moist enough by this very small bubbly flow of water. And uh, that works for other pollinators as well as the butterflies for both their water needs and puddling needs. Um, this is just a, a little solar fountain. We have a big bucket um, sunk in the ground. It has a, a very small motor in it, a tube that goes up into the rocks. And we have a solar one. So it's about 50 bucks, I think, might even be a lot less than that. And it has a small solar array that you can mount anywhere nearby. And then um, that will provide the power. Now, of course, it does only work when the sun is out, uh, but it works often enough that we're able to um, provide that water. We try and have the rocks so that they will collect uh, little bits of water as the flow goes so that some of it will stay in the rocks uh, even when the fountain is not flowing. And here's an example of that kind of thing that's on a deck. So you can have small butterfly gardens as well. I always say every plant counts. Um, when, when habitat is fragmented, uh, it's, you know, every way station is important. So this butterfly garden has a water source, it has a number of plant materials, and it has the rocks uh, as well. And you can see they've made uh, art uh, out of some of these rocks too. All right, now we get into choosing plants. Uh, so you can again use annuals, perennials, trees, and shrubs. And again, while natives may be best or required for some larvae, I also firmly believe that non-natives have a role to play too. And herbs might be uh, one of those non-native plants. Um, for example, parsley is highly favored by swallowtail butterflies, and uh, the larva will chow down uh, happily on that uh, parsley. Again, remember to leave some old foliage and stems in place for a while in spring, as you don't want to remove those eggs or pupa before they um, have developed. And again, that's about mid-April in the southern counties, but it um, gets later in the season as you go up the state. I just wanted to mention what native plants are and are not, and the times when you might want to use them versus times when you um, might make a different decision. So a native plant is one that's grown in an area for thousands of years. 
Um, they're well adapted. And we have in Wisconsin, uh, many of our natives are either woodland or prairie species. Um, we see most butterflies on the prairie species because that's a sunny environment or savanna uh, as well. Many of these uh, natives have huge ranges, like you can see here on this map. This is eastern redbud. Um, and as it goes through its range, you develop ecotypes that are adapted to each particular environment. Um, that means that even though it's the same species, a plant that has its uh, genotype developed in Texas is not going to survive in Wisconsin because of the cold winters. Whereas one that we, if we collected seeds from up here and planted them in Texas, they probably would not be able to survive the uh, heat and drought. So if you're trying to faithfully restore a prairie, for example, you don't want to collect your plants from any farther away, ideally than about 50 miles. However, if you're just putting together a garden or a butterfly garden, um, you may not need to worry about that or be worried about that. Um, so it depends on what your garden goals are as to whether you're going to be really worried about what your source is for those native plants if you're growing natives. Um, you Just to make things a little more complicated, there are things called nativars. That's kind of a play on the word cultivar, which means cultivated variety. We have cultivars of most plants that we grow. Um, whether it's vegetable, fruit, or perennial or annual. And uh, so native ours are native plants that have been selected for different ornamental um, attributes. Like this one is our native muscle wood. Um, Mike Yanni grew out some uh, seeds, selected some that were particularly narrow and had great fall color. And voila, you have a native R. And you might use a native R. A lot of them are selected because they're shorter or have bigger flowers and so are more attractive to people to grow or easier to grow in a home garden. All right, moving into the plants. Um, I'm going to share a few uh, annuals. And um, you can see here that uh, on the bottom picture, we have uh, some zinnias. Um, and we have monarchs that are feeding on, actually, this is a plant that you can grow as a house plant, uh, Kalanchoe. Uh, so they are not always going to be um, very fussy about where they get their nectar sources from. You just need to provide um, a variety of sources, again, that are blooming all season. So here is an example of an annual that probably a lot of you are familiar with, uh, Cosmos. It's native to Mexico, and we have two different species that we particularly grow. Sulfurious, uh, the Cosmos sulfurious are typically in this color range, the warm color range, and Bipinatus is typically going to be pink or white or magenta um, colors. Um, makes a good cut flower as well as a nice butterfly plant. And probably a lot of you are familiar with lantana. It's often used in hanging baskets and hummingbirds like it as well as butterflies. You can see it's got a nice perching surface and it's got a lot of small florets that the butterfly can stick its proboscis into and feed. And there are a ton of cultivars. Um, some of them are actually purple. Uh, and white, but many of them are going to be orange or yellow or even um, orange, yellow, and pink or pink and yellow or something like that. Typically, they're very bright uh, colors. There are some that are a little bit more upright, but many of them are spreading and again used in like taller containers or hanging baskets. Uh, this one is great, especially for late season blooms for um, butterflies, the Mexican sunflower or tithonia. Um, this one does take a while to get blooming. So if you can buy one that's been started already earlier in the season, it'll start blooming earlier and be um, blooming to support butterflies. 
each plant does not produce a whole lot of flowers, uh, at least not until it's really big later in the season. So I recommend um, planting, you know, at least um, three or four um, in order to provide enough um, nectar for the butterflies. They do end up being fairly large plants that take up some real estate. So that's something else to factor into your uh, design. Um, this one, I sometimes hesitate to recommend because it is a very seedy beast. And if you let it go to seed, you'll probably have it coming up again um, next year. However, if you want it to support butterflies, that's a good thing. Uh, so this is called tall verbena or stick verbena, but you'll often also hear it called verbena venariensis. It's a scientific name. Um, this one we have planted in our teaching garden next to the front door so that people can enjoy all the butterflies uh, that come to uh, sip nectar out of it. Um, it's a fairly easy to maintain plant and the color fits in nicely with a lot of other colors in the garden. Um, now, if we lived in uh, southern parts of the U.S., uh, we might not be able to grow that, but um, it's not uh, an issue here. And zinnias, I imagine a lot of you have probably grown. Um, we have the tall zinnias that are mostly used for cut flowers. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those are susceptible to powdery mildew. Um, but we also have the um, kind of ground cover ones that are a lot shorter and tend to grow in um, a, a mound uh, as opposed to a lot of single stems. The butterflies don't really care which one you have. I've seen them feeding on both of them. There might be some more slight preference for the taller ones because you often see butterflies um, a little bit higher up in um, the canopy of um, foliage and flowers. Um, this is a fairly easy plant to grow either from seed or you can buy market packs of it uh, already started in the spring. Uh, if you don't like powdery mildew, you might wanna try the Profusion series. They're shorter, but they are resistant to powdery mildew. Moving into perennials. And again, you know, we could be here all week talking about the different plants that are attractive to butterflies. Um, I'm just giving you a few that I recommend, and probably there will be a few that you won't see here that you're wondering why they're not here. For example, butterfly bush. Um, that is a great one for attracting butterflies. Now down south, it is considered an invasive here. The reason I don't recommend it is because it typically does not survive uh, in the winter. Now I can get mine to survive often two or maybe even three years unless we have a polar vortex. Um, but I really, if a plant is supposed to be a perennial, I don't like to recommend it if I am not confident that it's going to actually be a perennial. And of course, uh, some of them can be more expensive. So um, that's why that one isn't in this particular uh, presentation. Now, if you do want to uh, grow it and are willing to consider it an annual, by all means, uh, do go ahead and get that one. Um, Asclepius incarnata. This is one of butterfly's favorite milkweeds to um, uh, oviposit on. Um, that and uh, showy milkweed are particularly, and the uh, kind of thuggish common milkweed. I don't have common milkweed in here either because it is such a garden thug. Now, if you don't mind if your you know, plant is uh, bent on world domination and you don't care if it takes over your garden, sure, that is uh, great. But a lot of us like to grow a lot of different plants and the common milkweed doesn't get along well necessarily with its neighbors. It is not respectful of their boundaries. Um, swamp milkweed, on the other hand, grows in a clump. It is not the longest lived plant, so do be sure that you allow it to uh, produce seeds. It also will not survive well in um, places that have a lot of sandy soil. Um, but if you have heavy clay, hey, this is a great plant for you or wet um, areas. It will take uh, medium moisture too, just be sure and water it in drought years like this one. Blooms for about a month um, in the 
um, late summer, and it is used by a lot of insects also other than just um, monarchs and other butterflies. There are also some native ours. Cinderella is a bit shorter, and it is also a darker pink, and ice ballet is shorter and white. Um, this one, while very um, attractive as a nectar source, is not as attractive as an ovipositing plant. So um, this one does need better drainage. Uh, just regular soil ought to do it, or if you're in a sandier soil, um, this will be really a good plant for you. It's much shorter, stays in a clump, and uh, has a longer blooming period. There is a native R called Hello Yellow, which, as you might guess, has yellow flowers instead of orange. And we do have a native hummingbird mint um, flowers here, so you can grow the native species. I just happen to like this particular native R uh, because I like the color of the foliage. Um, but either one will attract um, butterflies. This one is going to be a lot shorter than the native species. And it blooms um, a pretty long time. So it is going to be there um, throughout for your butterflies to um, sip the nectar of. It will also take partial shade, which is kind of a nice thing. And um, this is a, a widespread species that you can uh, see in many natural areas. Um, Boltonia also has a very wide range. This is another native, uh, usually tends to be three to four feet tall. It's a lot easier to find the native R called snowbank, which tends to be more like three feet than it is to find the straight native, um, unless you're purchasing from a company that produces native plants. You're more likely to see snowbank in an average garden center. And it, again, looks very similar to the, um, the straight native species, but it's shorter. And uh, you can make it shorter still if it tends to fall over for you um, by cutting it back halfway no later than about June 15th. That will force it to branch out and become a more dense uh, plant. This one is great for a lot of different pollinators. I don't usually see a lot of larger butterflies on it, but a lot of the smaller species like it too. That isn't to say that I never see them, but um, this is a, a wonderful plant. It's got, look at that, June through October. Um, ours are not blooming quite yet, but they should be um, in bloom fairly soon. And this one does need as much sun as you can give it, dry to medium soils. And again, it just has that bloom all season. There are some other native R, or not native R's, cultivars that have uh, light purple flowers now as well. So this is not a native plant, but it is an excellent nectar source. Um, this is our native uh, cone flower. Purple coneflower is a native plant, but it is not native to Wisconsin. It's native a bit south. Uh, so this is our native coneflower. You can certainly grow purple coneflower as well. I just wanted to show you what the native looks like. Um, this one is uh, one that butterflies like as well. And Joe pie weed, wonderful plant for butterflies as well as other pollinators. Um, it does seed heavily. Um, I like to grow actually the native R's, Little Joe or Phantom, because they're much shorter. The wild type is over six feet tall. So um, in my little garden, that takes up too much real estate. Lots of Liatra species. We have about 12 here in the state. And this blooms in July and butterflies absolutely love it. I've seen, you know, the flower spikes absolutely covered with uh, butterflies. If you have heavy rabbit pressure though, that one may be harder to maintain. We do have a native Monarda, uh, Monarda fistulosa, that's the one in the top. And we have many cultivars uh, down below of Monarda uh, didyma. And there's also another species of Monarda that's uh, native to Wisconsin as well. Uh, unfortunately, all of them are susceptible to um, 
mildew. So if you don't like that, make sure that the variety that you buy is um, mildew resistant. Uh, do keep them in areas with good air circulation that helps to minimize that powdery mildew. And cat mint looks a whole lot like calamint. They are both in the mint um, family. Uh, this is um, one that butterflies really like, and it is a smaller plant. There are a number of different cultivars of cat mint uh, that are out there, some of them bigger, some of them smaller. Um, it usually has a very long bloom period, and with this particular variety, if you cut it back after its main flowering, it will flower again for you. Uh, lots of cultivars out there, so do check that out. Garden Phlox, another very familiar garden perennial. One that butterflies seem to really like is a cultivar called Gina. Uh, it has smaller flowers and smaller panicles, um, but for some reason, I've grown a number of flocks side by side, and they like that one a whole lot. Uh, pretty hardy throughout the state, zone four. Um, just northern part of the state may not be able to grow that one. I've put some of the um, mildew-resistant cultivars uh, here. And they generally are going to bloom July through August. Um, Lots of different aster species are native to Wisconsin. I do like this one because um, it attends, tends to be a little bit shorter and doesn't flop, so I don't have to worry about either um, pinching it back or staking it. Um, late season nectar source for uh, butterflies, very important um, uh, source of that. Now they do tend to seed, so that is something you should keep in mind. And there are several native R's of this particular um, aster. Now, I know most of you are groaning right now because a lot of people don't like goldenrod. Um, there are some goldenrods actually that bloom in spring. Uh, and not all of them are thugs like the Solitigo uh, canadensis, which is the Canada goldenrod. Uh, that's the one that the birds sometimes will drop into your um, your garden. I have a bunch I need to pull out this spring. Uh, and that one is kind of a, a garden thug. But a lot of these others are well behaved, like uh, fireworks, a really interesting growth habit, and uh, a nice butterfly magnet, uh, as well as some of these other shorter um, cultivars here. If you have allergies, I must say that goldenrod typically gets a bad rap because it blooms at the same time as ragweed, which has uh, pollen that's got a lot of spikes on it and tends to irritate your nasal passages. The pollen on goldenrod is smooth and typically is a lot less uh, irritating. Just a couple of herbs I'm gonna mention. Uh, any of these are uh, very attractive to butterflies, some as larval host plants and some as um, nectar sources or both, as the case may be. So um, lots of these that you can grow. Now trees, uh, if I recommend listening to Laura Gell's talk, uh, which I think was yesterday on uh, I believe it's called something like Trees for Bees. That's on our Pollinator Week website as well. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple of species, but Laura has a lot more that you should take a look at. Now consider that a lot of tree species are used as larval food. And you can see, um, now these are not all butterfly species that these plants are supporting. They uh, are pollinators of uh, all kinds, um, but they do support a lot of pollinating species, including um, butterflies. So those are some trees. Uh, here is one that I particularly recommend, which is serviceberry, which is a great garden plant. It is um, what I call a four season plant, gets wonderful white flowers early in the spring, great early season nectar source for pollinators, including butterflies. Uh, and it 
has uh, very nice sweet fruits if you can get them before the birds do in the um, summer. They're ripe uh, in southern Wisconsin right now. They start out red, turn to kind of a blueberry color, but they're sweeter than blueberries. And then they have awesome fall color. It may be golden like this, it may be more orange, it may be red, maybe a bright yellow, depending on the cultivar. Um, you can get straight species of amelanchor. We do have a couple uh, species that are native to Wisconsin. So if you, you know, prefer the straight native, you can certainly get that. Um, and there are some, there's a naturally occurring hybrid uh, as well in Wisconsin. Um, so these are also uh, the reason I said four season. It has beautiful silvery bark and a really graceful habit. So it looks great in the winter time as well as the other three seasons. And it has benefits of uh, berries attracting birds and uh, you know the fall color and so on. So it's a great garden plant. Pagoda dogwood, another beautiful plant for your shade garden. Uh, it likes partial shade and it is a native. Uh, so the more shade it's in, the more horizontal the branching will be. That's why it's called pagoda dogwood is because of that horizontal nature. Um, it is a larval host for some butterflies as well as um, a source of pollen and it produces berries that are attractive to birds. So what's not to like? Beautiful plant. Um, finally, there are uh, species of basswood. We have the American linden basswood, um, but there are also European species that are pretty commonly uh, available too. They all are going to produce these wonderful fragrant blossoms that are great nectar sources for lots of different kinds of pollinators. And they will support this um, American one over 150 species of caterpillars. So great source as well. And a few shrubs here, black chokeberry, uh, beautiful white blossoms that produce nectar, wonderful fall color, bright uh, red. And um, they do produce fruits that are used in the juice industry. Warning, they are very bitter. It's not called chokeberry for nothing. Um, and usually the birds will not eat the berries until they are well fermented in spring and they don't have anything else to eat. It grows well in sun to partial shade, and you can get a lot of different native R's uh, if you, you know, prefer a native R that is going to have uniform fall color and size and um, production of fruit. There are some that are uh, bred, especially because they have larger fruit. Um, I would not put them in a really dry area, though, because in the wild, you're going to find them in wetter areas. They will handle just regular moisture soil just fine, but not dry soil. And this one is so much fun. Um, this is a button bush, our native. Now, we do have one that I do recommend that was bred by Mike Yanni up at uh, Johnson's um, nursery where he does his breeding. He's got a company called JN um, Selections where he's bred a lot of um, plants that you will currently see on the market, woody plants. The, one, the reason I like Magical Moonlight is that it has um, good fall color, which most button bushes do not. Um, and it's a lot smaller than our straight native, uh, which does get very big and in my yard takes up too much real estate. If you do grow the straight species, it does often tend to have a lot of dye back. Um, so do expect that you're going to be cutting it back in the spring. I will say those Sputnik-like, and there is a variety called Sputnik, those Sputnik-like uh, flowers, very, um, the, you know, the flower head is a decent size, but each individual flower is quite small. Uh, a lot of the small solitary bees like it, as well as a lot of the smaller butterflies. And it's a larval host for 18 um, Lepidopteran species. Lepidoptera is the butterflies and moths. Sweet pepper bush blooms in July. Not a whole lot of plants that bloom in July. 
so this has also got a wonderful vanilla-like fragrance. It's a fairly small scale shrub and gets good fall color. So a great garden plant, as well as being a nice uh, pollinator plant and butterfly magnet. And we'll finish up here with some resources. Uh, most of these are ones I've already talked about before. There is one publication here from Colorado State that I think is really nice. And also I recommend the book, Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy. Uh, Doug is well rec uh, recognized as uh, an author on environmental subjects and particularly on native plants and pollinators. Um, so you might want to check that out. And I will take some questions. Thank you, Lisa. Wonderful presentation, so much information. So we have a few questions that have come through. Um, I'm thinking, could you stop sharing maybe? That way we could put you on the screen or oops okay hang on just a second there okay okay so we had a couple of questions regarding milkweed so um like the first one is and and this brought, got brought up at yesterday's presentation that the milkweed has not done great this year have you have you seen any instances of that or do you have anything you want to comment on that um, so can you repeat that question? Yeah, so someone has someone has shared in, the, in a question today as well as yesterday's presentation that the milkweed isn't doing as good this year as it has in past years. Oh, okay, years. got it. Um, yeah, so my guess is that uh, the drought is affecting the milkweed. Um, now, the species like um, Asclepias tuberosa, the orange flowering butterfly milkweed. That one, um, I haven't noticed any difference in the flowering, but the common milkweed and uh, the swamp milkweed, others that you know need a little more moisture, um, they're growing a little uh, shorter than usual this year and flowering uh, a little bit less. And I'm pretty sure okay. that's drought related. Great. Another question about milkweed, someone said they have been able to get um, some species of milkweed very easily, but she's been having trouble getting some of the other ones, Hertella, Gure de Florida, Flora, Lanu Ginosa. There's a couple other ones they mentioned. She recommends some of those other species. Uh, you have any recommendations on where you can get some of the more, you know, the more selective uh, species of milkweed? Got any recommendations on where to look for those type of things? Yeah, um, now we're not technically allowed to recommend one place uh, no. over another, um, but if you, there are some Wisconsin um, suppliers that um, should carry most of those things. And if they don't, they may be able to uh, recommend where you, um, where you can get them. So sorry, I can't really recommend one <laughs> company over another. Okay. Um, another question that somebody asked, do butterflies like roses or is it mainly bees? It depends on the type of rose. Uh, if you're talking about like the old style floribundas or hybrid teas and so on, those are not the greatest um, pollinator plants. But if you're talking about a wild rose or uh, a rose that has a single flower, so five petals, um, both butterflies and bees will like those a whole lot. They also like the Ragosa um, roses um, that I've noticed, but the more petals a rose has, the less nectar structures it often has uh, and pollen structures. So they, you know, are less attractive to, uh, to pollinators. Another question is how close together do the elements of your garden need to be for the butterflies to use? For example, she shared or he shared that they have a stream in the yard, but it's not right next to the garden. So if you could address some of those factors that you talk about that are essential for butterfly gardens, how close do they need to be? You know, ideally you would have the water source fairly close to the garden, um, but butterflies do, you know, have a range that they will fly. And if they can locate 
um, a water source, even if it's not particularly close to your garden, um, that should be that should be fine. Uh, however, if it is, you know, like 300 yards away from your garden, you might want to provide a water source that is closer. Um, an artificial, you know, water source like a brew bath or something like that. Somebody had a question regarding one of your slides. You had on um, for the the slide on cosmos. You had earwigs and slugs listed, and they wanted to know: do they attract earwigs and slugs, or re, or do these they repulse these type of insects? A good question. I'll have to fix that slide. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, occasionally, um, especially when they're planted thickly, um, if you have slugs or earwigs in your garden, um, they will chew on the foliage of um, cosmos. I have seen them pretty much denuded of foliage uh, in really wet years when there are uh, very high pressure from uh, slugs and earwigs. You know, in general, if you've got good um, spacing between your plants and a year like this year where, gosh, I haven't seen a slug all year yet. Um, it's been so dry that uh, you probably will have not much of a problem with those particular insects this year. On the other hand, aphids, spider mites, you're going to see a lot of those this year. So Margaret, I want to just talk, uh, turn it to you. Do you see any questions coming in that you'd like to um, ask Lisa? Yes, thanks, Anne. Uh, a couple of questions just came in. Uh, one is, do daylilies or irises provide anything to pollinators? Hmm. That is um, a good question. Um, I have not seen, well, I mean, I've seen pollinators on, on daylilies. I don't think that it rates particularly high on their um, list of uh, pollen and nectar sources. I don't usually tend to see it uh, on lists of pollinator plants. How about marigolds? That was another question. Um, those are typically not a great source um, because they've got so many petals um, that often comes at the expense of nectaries. Thank you. Um, so another question that came through, is there a drawback to having a butterfly garden right next to the house? Is there anything that need to be, any, anything that you need to think about? I don't think so. Um, I mean, it's not like, um, you know, it, it's, it actually, it, houses can be um, a place where butterflies can shelter from storms. Um, so I, I wouldn't see a problem with that at all. Um, another question was black-eyed Susans. You didn't mention that and somebody wanted to know if that is something that might attract a butterfly. Yes, yes, those do. Uh, unfortunately, it's only an hour long presentation and I'd be going on for probably three days if uh, I put everything in there. But yeah, that's a great one. So we want to remind everybody about the handout that lists the plant list that goes into a little bit more extensive on plant recommendations, correct? And of course, it's it's not necessarily a complete list uh, either. It would be very long. Okay. Uh, one last question. What are options for areas that have more shade than sun? Do you have any quick recommendations on that? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, it's not that butterflies don't go into the shade at, at all, um, but it's a question of finding plants that are uh, more attractive to them. So, uh, you know, like woodland sunflower um, might be one that they might like. Some of the other species that we've talked about, like um, asters, a lot of those can take partial shade. Purple coneflower can take partial shade. It actually, it takes a lot more shade than you'd think. Uh, purple dome aster is um, fairly able to uh, bloom well in shade. Turtle head. Um, will bloom well in, in partial shade. And those are all plants that butterflies as well as other pollinators like. Right. Well, it, it looks like we've come to the end of our time here. It's one o'clock. And so I think we're going to wrap it up for today. Um, Lisa, thank you so much for your presentation. It was wonderful. Thank you, Margaret, for helping today with um, 
moderating this uh, program. And we want to remind everybody, you can go back to the Pollinator Week website and see recordings for all programs that were held this week. Um, and, uh, and there's attachments for handouts for some of the programs too. So thank you for participating. We're glad you were here today. Thanks so much, Lisa. Thanks, Anne, and thanks, Margaret. Okay, thanks, Anne. Thanks, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Bye, everybody.